So in this second part, we'll talk about a few methods for troubleshooting any problems that may arise with your DPX files, starting with a few tricks I use when I get problem DPX sequences. This section aims to help identify it and report it to media area developers. Next, we'll look at the need for reversibility testing, particularly after a new version release, and ways you can investigate your DPX more closely with hex editors. Finally, I'll whisk through some of the BF5's interesting experiences and cover how we've dealt with patches and encoding from snapshots. So identifying the problem. Sometimes things won't behave as you would like them to, and when this happens, it's good to have a few techniques up your sleeve to help understand what's causing the problem. Using these two approaches, you could help resolve the issue yourself, or at least prepare some data to use when representing the problem elsewhere. As we've discussed, the best first step is to look at your logs and search for errors or warnings. Then take your error or warning message and search in the media area GitHub issue checker for raw code, because if anyone else has had this problem, they'll be talking about it here. So here's an example of a user finding error undecodable DPX expected data size is bigger than real file size. This message was in their logs. They followed this request with DPX metadata from Media Info and developer Jerome Martinez analyzed the DPX file and identified the problem for them. There is a massive amount of information to be gleaned from reading these issues. So if that doesn't uncover the problem, then you can use the dash D flag. This flag runs the raw cooked first analysis and then stop short of launching FFmpeg, but instead prints the FFmpeg command in full to your console or to your log output if you capture it. So you can see in this example, um, it reached completion of the analysis and provided the information for track one, which is the DPX image sequence, before giving the FFmpeg command in full, which has been generated by the raw cooked assessment. This specific example has gaps in the sequence, so Raw Cooked is using a concatenation list of DPX file to launch FFmpeg, as FFmpeg cannot, cannot, cannot encode an image sequence if there's a missing sequence number. So that's shown here as n504807 through to dot zero dot file list dot text. You can then use this FFmpeg command by copy pasting it and running it manually to see where there might be a problem. The console output you receive is very valuable and is worth copy and pasting along with metadata for your DPX files and placing in your own issue on the media area raw cooked issue tracker. It will give the developers a lots of information to start analysing what your problem is caused by. So reversibility testing is a great way of troubleshooting too. Um, when a new version of FFmpeg or raw cooked is released um, or upgraded, on your computer or server, things can change. So between FFmpeg releases, any number of improvements could be updated to Codex, which could impact your user experience. Similarly, there could be a specific feature of raw cooked that you find essential that's accidentally or deliberately deprecated with a software upgrade. And it's really best to find out about these problems, one or two encodings in, by doing reversibility tests. It's also worth doing them if you update your operating system. So to run a reversibility test, my first step would be to make an MD5 checksum for each of the DPX files in the source DPX folder. Whole file MD5 checksums are best as they include the header and the DPX as well as the image data, whereas the frame MD5 checks only look at the image data and don't take any of the header information into account. So this command uses the trusty find loop again um, to look within a DPX sequence folder for all files that end .dpx. It creates an MD5 for every single one, sorts them after the pipe there, sort, and then dumps them to the DPX sequence MD5 manifest.txt file. You only need a single right arrow when it's one lump of data that's being written to the text file. Next, I would run the same raw cook command against the FFE1 Matroska that's after it's been cooked and created um, so that it returns it back to a decoded DPX sequence. So here's a little test decode I configured using a folder just called DPX and a file called dpx.mkv. You can see here how easy it is to decode an FFE1 Matroska file. Raw cook senses 
the decode is required because the file passed to it is an FFE1 Matroska. So once decoding begins, a folder appears alongside the FFE1 Matroska called filename.rawcooked, which you can see down at the bottom. So dpx.mkv.rawcooked in this case. And within that folder is the original DPX sequence in its exact form, bit by bit perfect copy of the original source DPX. So once the MKV, MKV has been unpacked into a decoded DPX sequence, you can run the same MD5 checksum command against the decoded folder, but this time name it slightly differently, such as DPX decoded manifest.txt. Finally, you can compare these two manifests using Linux, Mac and Mac diff command. Uh, or for Windows, you can use the FC command. If there is any difference at all between the two supplied files, then it will list those differences in the console output. If nothing happens at all, then they're identical. So next, I want to think about hacking DPXs, which it sounds more exciting than it is. <laughs> um, you can use the SMPTE document 268M um, and a hex editor to interrogate your DPX files at a more granular level than you will be used to. So the SMPTE documentation is a standard defined for the exchange of digital moving pictures on a variety of media between computer based systems. The format digital picture exchange gives us the name DPX we're familiar with and outlines metadata requirements in the files, information header, image information header, image source, in, um, image source header, etc. So in figure five of the SMPTE document, you can see data for the DPX file information header, including an offset column, a uh, second in from the left. Tracking down this offset, you can count the binary offset start points to locate each of the metadata contents shown on the far right column. So the magic number starts at point zero, followed by DPX version number at offset eight, and image file name can be found at offset 36. So using a document like this, you can navigate an entire DPX sequence and understand what each block of data should represent in your DPX. Image name also has a length of 100, you can see in the length column. So the next item creation date begins at 136. So in a hex editor, like in this example, WX hex editor, um, which I downloaded for Linux, you can load a DPX and view the offset column so in the right hand side of the, of the screen there, the offset column is on the far left. The file name is highlighted at the moment and you can see it belongs at number 000036. So these are the numbers that we've just carried over from the SMPTE document. You can also see at zero, you've got SDPX, which is the magic number. At point eight, you can see which is at the very end of the first column on the right hand side. Um, you can see the 2.0 for the DPX version number, the file name we've seen at 36, but also down at point 136, you can see, and that's at, next to the offset number 135, but in one pair of numbers, you can see the creation date. So in this way, and with careful editing and backing up of your original DPX images, you could technically make changes to a DPX source file and run some spot tests on your raw cook workflows to see if these changes are noticed by raw cook between encoding and decoding. I did some similar tests recently while I was looking at the check function um, before using it for pre-sequence deletion in our automated workflows. I also used this method to edit the FFE1 Matroska file in the image block and see if the alteration was noticed when the item was decoded and it was, sure enough, all tests passed satisfactorily as I, was, as I would have wanted them to. So there's no reason why every user can't be a tester. And in this way, you'll have lots of amazing conversations on the issue tracker and hopefully improve the product for us all. But certainly don't be frightened of using hex editors. They're really helpful tools, but do always make sure you back up your DPX before you mess around with it. So BFI raw cooked experiences. At the BFI National Archive, we've been using Raw Cooked since uh, late 2019, when we launched our Heritage 2022 film digitization project that began encoding three petabytes, that's three million gigabytes of legacy DPX film scans to lossless open source format FFE1. 
This was the driving goal of the project. Our encoding started using raw cook version 18.10 with a simple raw cook command that ran through parallels and encoded 2K sequences quickly and efficiently. You can see the command there. It wasn't long before the software um, had its first problem, and that is with our legacy DPX sequences copied from LTO tape. They suffer frequent gaps in the sequences. Um, FFmpeg can't encode a sequence if there are gaps in it. It will just fail. So Jerome added a list concatenation feature to raw cooked, which resulted in a new flag that we used called accept gaps. The next issue we encountered was strange frame rates. Sometimes we were getting 2.5 frame, frames per second and others we would find would be 25 frames per second um, when actually they would have been 24 frames per second or 16 frames per second films. Uh, there was a bug in the algorithm that calculated the odd 2.5 frames per second which Raw Cooked um, developed a workaround for. The other defaults that weren't going to 24 but 25 um, and you, for those, there was a flag generated called the frame rate flag, um, which allowed us to overwrite um, the frame rates when DPX metadata wasn't wasn't present. Next, we discovered that we had non-zero padding in our DPX files, um, where most scanners place blocks of zeros. These DPX contained image data. So RawCooked was designed to store this zero header data in RAM and then write it to the reversibility data file so that the sequence can be perfectly rebuilt during decoding from FFE1 Matroska. The check function wouldn't cope with this padded data. Um, it wasn't, used, wasn't designed for it. So we needed to update our command to use a new flag, check padding, where padding data was discovered. We added a dual pass command that ran a check first and then reverted to the check padding when a padding warning was received in the logs. We later found that non-zero padding also contained too much image data that the reversibility file would get too large for the encoding to cope with and FFmpeg would trans truncate the reversibility data when adding it as an attachment. FFmpeg uh, will silently truncate an attachment if it's between one gigabyte and two gigabyte in size, but it will fail with a warning if over two gigabytes in size. This led to the BFI sponsoring development of a new feature in Raw Cooked, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. So in 2001, I had to spend less time spot checking Raw Cooked encodings due to a change in my role um, where I became developer for the BFI National Archive. Um, to cope with this, we implemented the hash feature to allow us to use the check feature in place of regular reversibility testings. A bit later on, the version 21.01 was released with the first implementation of the all flag. So we decided to move over to this command as it includes hash, default frame rates, check or check padding, automatic selection. We also found that gappy sequences were going through unnoticed and implemented the no accept gaps flag that allows us to present, prevent the accept gapped default feature for our business as usual encodings. We want to know when there's an unexpected gap, as it would indicate a fault with the scanner or copying method, uh, methods. You can't use the dash Y feature for this if you want to prevent encoding, but you'll need to change the dash Y to a dash N so that the, so that the um, script exits instead of encoding the file. Finally, in version 21.09, our sponsored feature to handle the large reversibility files was implemented and output version 2 was introduced to be selected when a file has non-zero padding and the reversibility data is likely to be over one gigabytes in size. Raw Cooked will append the data after the encoding is completed. Uh, this isn't included in the all command at the moment and is only an option in our scripts as and when we need it. The most important thing to note about this flag is that items encoded in Raw Cooked version 21.09 with output version 2 are not backward compatible with earlier versions of raw cooked, which is why it's so important to capture the encoding information about the files that we're making. So when a problem is found with how the software handles certain DPX irregularities, raw cooked developer Jerome will generate a patch, which is most likely a new block of code written to implement a fix to the problem. 
These problems are often identified by users who could have unusual DPXs and are generally reported at the raw cooked GitHub issue tracker. When a patch has been implemented, a new unofficial version of raw cooked will be released. So this will be the full software, but it'll also have the additional patch. And it can be tested by that user until the patch is implemented in a future release. These releases are called snapshots and are not to be really downloaded or used by new users unless you've got experience. So for every amendment we made to Raw Cooked and that we just demonstrated in the evolution of our codes, um, a new flag would have been implemented, which was a new patch, which meant a new snapshot. So we were running a lot of our encoding from the snapshots that were released by Jerome. So just for interest, you can view the latest snapshot releases on MediaArea.net's website. Um, the address is at the bottom there. Inside each of these snapshot folders, uh, the date indicates when they were released. Um, you'll find binary packages, which are individual releases for supported operating systems identified by the name. Uh, these can be downloaded and installed to your server for testing. It's unlikely that you'll ever need to download or use a snapshot. But if you do, the installation will be unique to each operating system and you can find lots of guides online. So Linux Ubuntu, for example, uses DPKG software and it's looking for a Debian package, um, which is .deb to be downloaded and installed, um, which you can see in the bottom examples there. Also worth noting about those bottom two, um, avoid downloading any snapshots with DBG or debug in the name. Um, as those two bottom ones do right at the beginning. These are developer releases that have extra levels of debugging information and they won't run in the way that you expect them to. Okay, and finally, it's worth pointing out that there are a few issues that just can't be resolved. So, if you find your DPX files have two separate image elements for the RGB and alpha, then I'm afraid as yet there's no support for encoding this in FFmpeg or raw cooked. It would encode your file, but it would discard the second image element, the alpha channel, which would fail the hashes and checks um, in raw cooked and also lose you very valuable data. For the time being, we're having to tar wrap these DPX sequences and we will look to sponsor this development in the future. And that's everything. Um, thank you ever so much. That concludes the presentation. I would be very happy for questions at this point.